Hey guys, this is Chef Hawks here, and so now we are getting into chapter number six, so an introduction to food safety. So this is something that's key and critical to everything that we do in the kitchen and in the front of house. We can have the most incredible restaurant, the most incredible private club or hotel or cruise ship, but the problem is, is that if we don't have good food safety, we can poison people, we can kill people. So it's, it's up to us to make sure that we create an environment that limits the risk as much as we possibly can. So that's what we're going to dive into today. So first of all, looking at what is a foodborne illness. So this is when we have a disease which is transmitted to people by food. It has to be a disease transmitted to people by food. So how do we determine what is a foodborne illness outbreak? So you hear about these on, on the television or on, uh, on the internet where there may have been an E. coli outbreak. Well, how do they determine what's an outbreak? What, what is the minimum requirement for it to be called that? It's actually very small. If you have two or more people who are confirmed to have eaten the same food, then they conduct an investigation and the lab analysis confirms then you have technically an outbreak. Now, of course, generally we only hear about outbreaks which involve maybe hundreds or thousands, maybe across several states, uh, if it's something really big, but that's because the news likes to report big things. But the fact is there are a lot of these incidents that happen every year. Luckily in this country where we have a lot of rules um, and we have a lot of smart people who understand it, like you guys are going to be soon, then we um, are able to limit the the dangers of most of the time uh, the issues that we can have with food. But that still leaves about 48 million cases each year in the United States. One out of six Americans gets sick. And if you think about it, the last time you may have been sick uh, from eating something uh, that wasn't uh, that didn't agree with you, it's possible that could have been food por uh, food foodborne illness, and you probably didn't even report it. It's generally only when it gets really serious. But we have about 128,000 hospitalizations each year because of foodborne illness and about 3,000 deaths. So what are the impacts and the costs on, uh, of a foodborne illness? So it has impacts on the actual operation. So you're going to have loss of guests and sales because when people hear about these types of things, they're going to avoid your, your establishment. You're going to have a loss of reputation, which could be catastrophic to that business, even remaining in business. The negative media exposure can be catastrophic, and the staff morale can be terrible, because they don't know if they're going to keep that job. They don't believe in that company anymore, uh, because they don't necessarily trust that company anymore. So you, it can end up being that we have lawsuits, um, you have lots of legal fees that could come from this, especially if someone... Uh, dies from that foodborne illness, it can be really catastrophic, or if they have long term uh, issues from it. You can end up having staff absenteeism, where they just don't want to go into work and hear about the problems that are going on. Insurance premiums can go through the roof. Every business must be insured uh, so that they financially um, are protecting themselves and protecting their guests in case if something does go wrong. You may have insurance companies who either increase your insurance premiums because you're such a high risk or they may not want to insure you at all because you're too high of a risk. It's going to take a lot of staff retraining. That takes time and money and very often for something serious it means that a business is going to close down for a period of time while they do this training as well. So the victims, well they have a terrible experience. They're, they may not be able to go to work because they may be so sick they may have some hefty medical costs involved in their treatment. There may possibly even be long-term disability, damage to certain vital organs and things like that, and they can die. So there is a higher risk of foodborne illness uh, to certain areas of the public. And so that generally we count three areas of the public that are most at risk. So people who have a weakened immune system, they can't fight the illness. They may be fighting cancer or they may have AIDS um, or various other ailments which mean that their immune system uh, is, actually, is, is actually low and it can't defend itself against uh, the foodborne illness. We also have 
elderly people. Uh, so we're talking about uh, retirees, maybe 70 year old plus. And we're talking about preschool age children, four years, uh, four years and younger, who may not have the ability to be able to fight against it. Um, people with the compromised immune systems. But what kind of types of uh, contamination can we look at here? So we, we break it down into three categories because these hazards can, uh, can potentially cause great harm to us. So we have uh, biological, we have chemical, which actually if you look over on the right hand side here, we have a great example of a chemical one here. Someone's trying to clean up, but there are food items right next to this that could be sprayed. And then you have physical. Let's go into some more detail on these. So let's look at the forms of contamination that we can find. So this can be uh, things like harmful items that are in the food. We can see a great photograph here of a perfect example where we actually have a twist tie right here that was found in the mac and cheese. Very unsafe to eat. We have microorganisms. So these are small living organisms, generally little single cell uh, organisms that you can only see through a microscope. Humans can carry them and these can cause illnesses. So the types of bacteria and microorganisms that humans carry are called pathogens. And pathogens are a food safety threat. So we have four different types of pathogens that we have to deal with. So we have viruses, bacteria, parasites, and fungi. So let's look at viruses. So viruses are actually the leading cause of foodborne illness. They can survive in refrigerator and freezer temperatures. They literally just go to sleep. Um, and then they just come right back around again when they start to warm up again. They don't grow in the food. They will grow when they're inside a person's intestines. The, the inside a person's intestines or an animal's intestines is the perfect place, the perfect environment for them. But they'll survive just fine on the food itself. So these can be found, viruses can be found in food, water, contaminated surfaces, and on other people. Hepatitis A and norovirus are the most prevalent viruses that we generally find in food. So we prevent the spread of viruses by if you are sick, you stay at home. If you've got vomiting, diarrhea, or jaundice, which jaundice is an issue um, that's going on with your kidneys and so, um, sorry, with your liver. And so that will actually indicate that there can be some yellowing um, around, especially around the eyes or on the, on the whites of your eyes. Um, and so if you have any of these items, then you should not be going into work. You should make sure that you're washing your hands. We want to avoid using bare hands um, on, on foods, especially ready to eat foods. We'll discuss those more later. But let's look at bacteria. So bacteria can grow very rapidly. They create toxins and cooking doesn't always kill, it doesn't kill the actual toxins itself. The toxin isn't a living thing, the bacteria is. The toxin is an actual poison. And the, the toxins cause illness. So what are the specific types of bacteria that we're most concerned with in the largest amounts? So we have Salmonella typhi, non-typhoidal Salmonella, Shigella and sugar toxin producing E. coli. So, yes, there are lots of other bacteria around Bacillus aureus, Clostridium botulinum, Clostridium perfringens. I can name reams of them, but these are the most important ones for you to remember. These are the most prevalent ones that we find in foods today. But when we look at when we look at bacteria specifically, uh, we can actually see incredible growth going on when there are the perfect conditions for growth. So now we're going to look at this acronym here. This is Fat Tom, poor old Tom. But the fact is, this is a useful way for us to remember the really important things that we need to work on, especially when we're dealing with food, to limit our, our dangers from bacteria. So let's take a look down the list that we have in just a moment, but I want you to look first at this chart right here. So if these conditions are perfect for the bacteria, say if we have one single cell, and we all know there isn't ever one single cell of any bacteria around, 
They hang out with their buddies. There's always lots of them around. But for this example, we're just going to take a look at one. So after 20 minutes of perfect conditions, they multiply by binary fission. They literally just divide, and now you've got two. Another 20 minutes goes by. We now have four. After an hour, we now have eight. After an hour and 20 minutes, we have 16. Say if we had a piece of meat um, that we had taken out from the freezer and we left it over on the, uh, on the side overnight just to defrost. And we're like, yeah, he'll be fine. It's cold, right? Well, at, at first it's cold, but once it starts to defrost, because we are not defrosting it in a safe way, and we'll go in to more details about how we can do that, then after a while, some of that meat will start to warm up and get into what we call the temperature danger zone. That's a new word that you're going to hear about a lot of coming up shortly. But the fact is, the bacteria are now in the perfect conditions to start growing. And so say if you left that meat out overnight, you went to bed, you got up in the morning, and now you're going to start preparing it, and you're going to cook it later on. So after 10 hours, that one bacteria is over 1 billion. So this is where we really get into the danger area where we can really start causing bad problems for people with possibly our great food that we were hoping to um, make for people to enjoy. So let's take a look down our list of our items here. So with Fat Tom, we have food, acidity, temperature, time, oxygen, and moisture. So what kind of foods do bacteria eat? They love carbohydrates and they love protein. So carbohydrates, with that we're looking at things like wheat, so anything with flour, so we've got breads, um, we've got um, pastas, we've got um, any, um, pizza bases, um, any of these types of things. Uh, you can have potatoes, any of these kinds of things that have carbohydrates. This all, also includes sugar. Because at the end of the day, carbohydrates break down into sugar. So any of the sweeter kinds of things also have food for bacteria. It also includes protein. So protein, that's where you're going to have things like meats especially. But it can be in cheeses and yogurts, um, all sorts of uh, different things like that. But also including things like soy that, is a, uh, that has protein in it that's a vegetable. So it doesn't necessarily just include meats and animal products. Acidity. Think of a bacteria as being kind of similar to us. When you look at the acidity level of where a bacteria likes to be, it's right between about uh, 4.6 and 7.5 um, on the pH scale. It's pretty close to neutral. Well, that's because bacteria are fairly, fairly well like us in the fact that they enjoy being in a comfortable position. Not too acidic, not too alkaline. The temperature, they love it when it's between 41 degrees Fahrenheit and 135 degrees Fahrenheit. So that's right in what we call the temperature danger zone. And we're going to talk a lot about that. We'll talk a lot about that when we're in the kitchen, when we're cooking, and when we're making sure that we're cooking things through, and when we're reducing temperatures on food to store, and how important it is to keep foods outside of that temperature danger zone as much as possible and we're going to show you different methods that we use to ensure that that's what happens in our kitchen and so time we looked at time just a couple of minutes ago where we looked at how quickly every 20 minutes another one another one another one and all of a sudden you can go from one bacteria and after 10 hours you've got a billion bacteria so uh, t uh, time is something we need to be very careful of about having things in the temperature danger zone. Oxygen, this comes down to a couple of different um, ends of the scale. You have bacteria who require oxygen, and you actually have some bacteria that require an absence of oxygen. Uh, so the factor of oxygen is very important for different bacteria. And then moisture. Bacteria love and need to have moisture within the food that they're eating and within the environment that they're living. This is why we can take things like rice, which have both carbohydrates and protein, and we can have them dried out for years 
and they'll be perfectly safe for us to cook. If there's, uh, but once we cook that that rice and we add that moisture back in, now it is a food item that we have to be very careful with. We have to treat it like meat. We have to make sure we keep it in the refrigerator, and we have to use it up within a fairly short period of time to make sure that we're being safe with it. A great example of uh, of a uh, vegetable or a fruit, technically, is a tomato, uh, which has lots of sugar in it. Tomatoes in the middle of summer are nice and juicy and sweet, but they have a lot of moisture. They have a very high moisture level, so they can really allow bacteria to multiply rapidly. So the two things, out of all of the things in Fat Tom, the only two things we can control is time and temperature. So those are the two things that every single time, if we control both of those, we can be assured that we are doing everything we can to protect our food. So let's take a look at TCS foods. So how, uh, how do these work? So this is what we call time and temperature control for safety foods. So these are the types of foods that are very susceptible to bacterial growth because they have all of the fat tom conditions. So let's take a look and see what we're talking about here. Foods that are most vulnerable to pathogen growth are foods that need to be time and temperature controlled for safety, TCS food for short. Certain foods need time and temperature control to keep them safe. These include baked potatoes, heat-treated plant foods such as cooked rice, beans, and vegetables, fish, shellfish, and crustaceans, meats such as beef, pork, and lamb, poultry, shell eggs, sliced melons, cut tomatoes, leafy greens, sprouts and sprout seeds, tofu or other soy proteins found in meat alternatives, milk and dairy products, and untreated garlic and oil mixtures. These foods all have the kind of characteristics and conditions in which pathogens love to multiply. One way to keep pathogens down is to minimize the temperature range in which pathogens grow well. This range is known as the temperature danger zone. The range between 41 degrees Fahrenheit, 5 degrees Celsius, and 135 degrees Fahrenheit, 57 degrees Celsius. The longer food stays in the temperature danger zone, the more time pathogens have to grow. To prevent pathogen growth, limit the amount of time food spends in the temperature danger zone. Always make food safety the highest priority. Be vigilant with time and temperature control and keep foods away from the temperature danger zone. All right, so just to recap on that video there. So we have all these items, TCS, time and temperature control for safety. I guess it should be TTCS, but we are shorten it because it's easier to remember TCS, but time and temperature control for safety foods. So all of these foods have protein or, or carbohydrates or both, and then it has all of the other fat tom factors that can play in. And so we're controlling time and temperature to make sure that they are as safe as possible. So we've got baked potatoes, we have fish, uh, heat-treated plant food, things like rice and beans, and vegetables. We've got different meats, milk and dairy products, and poultry. Shell eggs, and shellfish, crustaceans. And then sliced melons, cut tomatoes, and uh, cut leafy greens. And sprouts and sprouted seeds. And then tofu and other different types of soy proteins. Um, they've got lots of different proteins that are made uh, from vegetable bases. And then untreated garlic and oil mixtures. So let's look at our temperature danger zone again. So from 41 degrees Fahrenheit up to 135 degrees Fahrenheit is right in the area where we need to make sure that our TCS foods are out of that range. So what happens below 41 Fahrenheit? Well, that's refrigeration. So our refrigerator must always be at 41 or below in order for the food to be outside of the temperature danger zone. It serves two purposes. The fact is, is that when we're preparing foods in our in our restaurant, 
We want to make sure that it has the longest shelf life we can possibly give it. Well, if it's a TCS food, we want to make sure that those foods stay in that refrigeration as much as possible so that they have the longest shelf life. So hopefully we're going to sell it before they, uh, before they expire. But also it limits the bacterial growth so it keeps that food safer too. At 135 degrees, that is what we will call hot holding. This is where when we've cooked foods, if we are maintaining that food for a period of time, it must be maintained over 135 degrees Fahrenheit. So this could be if you've ever been to a buffet, then their foods may be kept hot in chafing dishes, under heat lamps, or on hot plates, just to make sure that they stay at at least 135 degrees Fahrenheit. And this is something that a lot of restaurants can really struggle with at times if they don't have the equipment set correctly, if they don't have the foods, the correct foods placed in the right kind of hot holding equipment. Okay, I want to show you this time lapse. Uh, it shows bacterial growth. And so the scary kind of thing about this and the way that this has been divided up, you're going to see this top third up here was actually taken from a swab from a kitchen table and some kitchen equipment. Over on the left hand side was actually from a urinal and then over on the right hand side we actually gathered that bacteria from, the, from a tap handle on an urn. So probably an urn that's been used by several different people maybe not washed as frequently. Let's take a look at the bacterial growth. So if we hold it right here, so we can see the bacteria that was swabbed from a kitchen table and kitchen equipment. This is a serious problem. We can actually see how rapidly and, and you know, vehemently this has grown. This is a real problem. And we still have a fairly significant amount of bacteria, all these colonies popping up from both the urinal and from the urn handle. So that tells me that we are having problems with people possibly either not washing or cleaning um, after they've possibly used one or the other. But up here, this is a serious concern because this is something, this is a place where we're actually preparing food. And now, before we move on to the next thing, I want to take a look at your cell phone because I know that most of you probably have a cell phone and you probably look at your cell phone a lot each day. So maybe you might want to think about where you're looking at your cell phone, how much you're using it, and how often do you wash your hands after you touch that cell phone. This is actually the front and back of somebody's phone, but you can see that there's quite a lot of bacteria on that plate. You know, bacteria are part of our normal life. They're not going to harm us, they're not dangerous can't be paranoid about bacteria because they're everywhere, but clearly throughout the day, you could possibly become exposed to potentially pathogenic bacteria. So we began to question, what about cell phones? How contaminated are those cell phones? So we had uh, 19 people offer up their cell phones to be tested, and we swabbed first the front of the cell phone, and we swabbed the back of the cell phone. So we had a total of 38 samples. So when it comes to the laboratory, what we do is we take those swabs, we do a quick little vortexing just to make sure it's an even distribution. So now we're going to inoculate the specimen onto the media, and we use two different types of auger plates. They're actually kind of like food for the bacteria, and for some plates we add different things that are going to help the bacteria grow. So there's 5% sheep blood in there because bacteria like to use that sheep blood to grow. And then we use a sterile plastic needle in order to kind of spread the specimen across that auger surface so we can get isolated colonies. So what will happen now is we'll put these plates into an incubator that simulates the human temperature, which is approximately 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. We'll look at them after 24 hours of incubation, and then we'll look at them again after 48 hours. So what was surprising is of the 19 individuals that 
allowed us to culture their phones. All but two were positive for bacterial growth. Uh, the most common bacteria we found would be things that you would find on your, on your hands. So here's an example. Those larger colonies you see are called bacillus, but you can see that there's quite a lot of bacteria on that plate. Two of our subjects had potentially pathogenic bacteria on their phones. One person had some colonies of Staphylococcus aureus over here. The other person had the strain that we uh, refer to as MRSA. Um, that's certainly not something you would want to get into a wound uh, as it could cause an infection. We know that a lot of people are using these phones in the bathroom. And of those 19 people, about 75% actually said, yeah, I use the phone in the bathroom all the time. Two of those 75% of individuals did have uh, positive growth for bacteria that we would normally associate with stool or feces. that we did just take a snapshot of cell phones that were within one office but you know it just kind of supports the fact that maybe cleaning the phone on a regular basis might be a good idea so yes the next time you're using that cell phone uh, maybe while you're eating you may want to consider what might be on that cell phone maybe we should be cleaning our cell phones a little more frequently than we do and maybe some people need to be looking at their habits of when they're using that cell phone. But this is just another reason why we don't use our cell phones in the kitchen. We don't take our cell phones out in the kitchen. Um, it's important that those things are kept away just so that we don't have cross-contamination occurring from something that we can avoid. So let's, let's now look, take a look at ready-to-eat foods. What is a ready-to-eat food? So this is a food item which we are not going to go forward and heat up for, uh, for any reason to kill off the bacteria. We're not going to process it in a way that would get rid of the bacteria which are on that food item. So we have to be very careful when we're dealing with these items. So there's not going to be any preparation, any washing or any more cooking. So these are things like uh, washed fruits, deli meats and seasonings. So let's take a look at parasites. So this is another type of contaminant that can get into our food. In this country, we are very, very lucky in that it's not very common to have parasites in our food products, um, but it can happen on very, very small occasions. Um, they don't grow in the food itself. They can survive in the food, but they grow in a host. They will look for a host because uh, they need that host for nourishment, for protection, um, and so they're looking for a person, for animal, um, or of plants, and also in water. So um, how is it that we make sure that we lower the risk of possibly having parasites in our food? Well, so these can, these can also include things like protozoa, roundworms, tapeworms, and toxoplasma gondii, uh, which causes uh, toxoplasmosis. The best way we can avoid having parasites is to purchase foods from reputable suppliers and make sure that our water supply is a safe, treated water supply. And that's generally what you're going to have from the tap coming into your kitchen. So if we make sure that we're always going to approve reputable suppliers, uh, they generally have systems in place to make sure that whatever country they, they brought those foods in from, they have supply chain checks all along the way to make sure that they're avoiding the possibility um, of parasites getting into our food products. Fungi can be another problem. So these can cause illnesses, and they can spoil foods in, uh, that we enjoy as well. So where do we find fungi? Well, it's in the air, soil, plants, water, and some foods as well. So the fact is, is that fungi are all around us. They're everywhere. So these are generally uh, mold. Uh, there, there can be tiny little uh, plants that literally can just buzz around in the air around us. 
And they can really grow under any conditions. They can grow in refrigeration conditions where bacteria find it hard to grow. Um, but they can grow in pretty warm, arid conditions as well. They can grow in acidic foods, things like tomatoes that could be high in acid. They can grow in those. They can grow with very little moisture at all. So we'll find those in things like jams that have been opened um, and uh, the, uh, the air has been able to contaminate them. In things like jellies and bacon as well, we can find mold problems. The mold can spoil our food. It can produce toxins as well, which is where it can, it can be a problem for us to eat. And cold temperatures don't destroy them. Um, but they can be used intentionally on our foods to create new flavors. So take a look at the photographs that I have over on the right here. So this is a block of cheddar, and so this has mold growing on it. And you can actually see the dry skin that's around the outside of this cheddar. This cheddar has been spoiled by this mold. Now when you look at this English Stilton that we have right here, they've actually pressed holes through this and inoculated it with molds to create these blue veins going through the cheese. It's absolutely delicious. That's exactly the way it's supposed to look because they've taken a very specific strain of mold and inoculated it into that cheese and it's eaten the uh, it's it's enjoyed eating both the protein and the uh, sugars that are naturally in that cheese and it produces wonderful green veins with lots of really great flavors. So yeasts can spoil food very quickly. Uh, they make them smell um, and they can taste of alcohol because uh, the natural fermentation process can happen <clears throat> where you can have yeasts can grow and create alcohol in that food product. You get either white or pink discoloration going on. Sometimes foods can get slimy. Um, if it's liquids, then you can have bubbles start appearing. Yeast will generally like to have foods that are at least slightly acidic uh, with little moisture. Uh, you should always discard foods that, that display uh, mold problems. Uh, so things like jams, jellies, honey um, can also mold. And but they can be used in uh, used in useful situations as well. Uh, we can we can actually create things like beer. We can actually use it to create wine, and we can use it to make our sourdough starter, which is a leavening agent when we're making sourdough bread. So let's take a look now at biological toxins. So these can be plants or animals uh, that can contain natural toxins in them. So this can get into our food chain and can be quite lethal. It can really make people very, very sick. So one example of this is fish that eat toxic algae. And those toxins may not hurt the fish itself. The fish may have built up a resistance to it. But the problem is that that toxin can build up and up and up in the flesh of that fish. And so when we go to eat that fish, it can actually poison us. The other thing is with poisonous wild mushrooms. Um, if you ever go picking mushrooms um, out in, the, in nature, you have to make sure you know exactly which ones you're picking. Because ones that are quite lethally poisonous can look very similar to ones that are very tasty. Chemical con contamination. We have a great picture right here of, a, of an example. So we've got this is our dry storage facility, and then someone has placed a, uh, a chemical spray right over here. So generally speaking, most of the time chemical contamination uh, comes from cleaners, sanitizers, polishers, uh, different chemicals that we may use in the kitchen itself when they've been poorly stored. We always store um, any chemicals separately away from foods, um, preferably in a completely different section of the kitchen. You'll see in our kitchen, in the career center, we actually have our, our chemicals are generally stored over the, um, over the pot wash sink area on a shelf that's on the opposite side of the kitchen from where any food storage is and where any food preparation is occurring. Uh, the backup plant products are actually over in a storage closet that's on the opposite side of the classroom, far away from any food. It's very important that we always make sure that we keep those uh, in a situation like that so that they can't contaminate food. But it's also very important that we always follow the manufacturer's directions for using them. Because when we're cleaning pots and pans, we want to make sure that we don't have um, any uh, excess on those that can be left in, in residual amounts that could cause contamination problems too. 
So physical contamination. Physical contamination can be things which should not naturally be occurring in that food product. So what we can see over here, we have a fish bone, which is in this salad. Well, a fish bone is a natural item, right? It's part of the fish, but it should not naturally be in this garden salad. And so that's the problem. So this is physical contamination. Another physical contamination could be something like a Band-Aid that's fallen off into food as well. It's a physical item which has fallen off into the food that should not be occurring there. Generally, this is caused by accidents and mistakes. Someone messed up somewhere along the line for that item to get in there. So it can be things like fingernails, hair, bandages, uh, fruit pits. Uh, it can be broken glass from bulbs, jewelry, or metal shavings from the can. When we, go and, uh, when we go and use the can opener to open up the can, sometimes you can get burrs which can come up on the side. Always be very careful. You can see one right here as well, and one here leading through these peaches. Always be very careful to make sure that none of these can ever get into your food products to contaminate them. Actually, you have large companies um, like Tyson that produce uh, chicken nuggets and chicken products. They will actually have... Uh, metal detectors on their uh, on their lines to make sure that no nuts or bolts or any other kind of uh, contaminants, physical contaminants, got into the food as it went through. They they know that they have deep pockets and that they can be they can fall victim to someone accusing them of having contaminants in their foods. So they have to make sure that they do everything they possibly can to avoid that ever happening. So with physical contamination, it's all about prevention. We're inspecting our food closely. We have good personal hygiene. We're making sure when we come in, our chef coat is nice and clean so we don't have food from the previous day dropping off it into our food. Making sure that we, don't ha that we have our hair um, wrapped up and so and we have any long hair tied back so that nothing's getting into the food. And it's all about having certain preparation procedures in place so that we're not contaminating our food. Let's now talk about food allergies. So with food, with uh, bacteria, and fungi, and viruses, we talk about possible cross-contamination of foods where we want to make sure that we don't have, say, a raw hamburger that we're preparing. We don't want to use a ready-to-eat food being chopped on that same chopping board and contaminating one another, causing cross-contamination. Well, we have something a little different here. So what is a food allergy? So a food allergy is when you have a negative reaction to a food protein. And there are certain specific proteins that we can find in our foods that can cause this reaction in certain people. So those are called food allergens, the proteins that actually cause the allergic reactions. So our immune system starts, uh, it starts to attack the protein. It gets a little confused with exactly what it is, and it causes our body to have that reaction. Sometimes it can cause our windpipe to start closing up because, uh, because it starts to swell. Um, or it could be that other parts of your body just start to swell um, and, and start breaking out in certain ways. So what we call when we're dealing with allergens and with food allergies is we call it cross-contact. So it's very important that you distinguish the difference. Cross-contamination is with food that's been contaminated with uh, biological problems um, or physical contaminants or chemical contaminants. When it comes to allergies, we are specifically talking about cross-contact. So an allergen food, uh, that's when an allergen food has touched um, another food item. And so the proteins mix. And so if someone is allergic to, say, shellfish, then if that shellfish has been prepared on that chopping board, and then you come along and you and you... Make a um, you make a burger and you and you put the you have the bun resting on that board that that shellfish was resting on. Now the shellfish protein have attached themselves onto that bun, and so we now have cross contact. So this is something that we must make sure we avoid. So let's take a look at the big eight. There are more than these, but these are the big eight. The what the eight which affect more of our population than any other allergen that's around. So we have crustaceans, shellfish, like things like crabs, lobster, and shrimp. We have eggs. We have different fish, 
especially things like tuna and cod. And we have milk. We also have peanuts, soy, which may, um, this is a, a texturized vegetable protein right here, which is made with a soy base. And then we have tree nuts, such as almonds, walnuts, and pecans, and wheat. But when we're serving guests who have food allergies, we have to take this very seriously. So if you're a server in a restaurant, or if you're the chef in the back of house, you must make sure that you are putting in place security measures to make sure that people are safe who have food allergies in your establishment. So you must be able to explain exactly how that dish is made. Having servers who understand their menus is a definite priority when it comes to this type of issue. You must state any secret ingredients that you might actually have in your food items um, to, to ensure that your guest isn't going to get sick from them. You might want to suggest alternative items. Um, if they start suggesting that, well, I'll probably be okay, you may want to suggest something different just to make sure that they stay safe when they're dining with you. So identify uh, the special order um, with the kitchen. Make sure you write it down clearly. Make sure you explain it to them. Don't just drop off a ticket that says they, that they can't have any peanuts. You must explain to the kitchen that there is a food allergy issue and that there must be no nuts, no peanuts, and it must have no cross-contact either. Uh, you want to make sure that you hand-deliver that order directly to that guest. Make sure that no one who's been around those allergens is going to then be serving that guest. Make sure the kitchen is using um, separate pans, pots, and chopping boards, knives, so that they're not cross-contact uh, cross uh, causing issues. So we never guess at any of the items that may be in the food. Always check with the manager. If you have, um, if you have someone who says that they're deathly allergic to something, never think that you're, you're going to be okay if you don't know for sure. So when we're prepping our food, we're always making sure that we don't transfer any allergens to anything. Um, we can't make that food safe again. If it's been in, if it's been in a cross-contact situation with another allergen food, then that food cannot be served to someone who has that allergy. Set the food aside and do not serve it. So how do we avoid cross-contact? Uh, we check uh, the recipes and the ingredient labels. If someone says that they're deathly allergic to peanuts and that food item has been produced in a factory uh, which also um, produces items that have peanuts in, then there may be enough of an allergen in there to cause a problem for that person. So you have to do all that you can to make sure that there are no allergens that they have problems with that are present. So how do we get rid of allergens if we've dealt with them um, and we now need to clean our, um, our food preparation items? Well, this comes down to our regular cleaning cycle that we use when we're using our three-pot sinks. So we wash using a detergent, we rinse the uh, the preparation item off and then we sanitize it with a good sanitizer. So this is how we clean uh, away any cross-contact issues with cookware, utensils and equipment and with food preparation surfaces um, and with our utensils as well. Always keep allergens separate. When you look into our refrigerators you should always have all the food should be sealed, should be wrapped up nice and tightly and not touching each other and certainly not sitting on top of each other when things can drip from one to another. We're going to talk more about how we stack our refrigerator um, coming up in a couple of units. We're always looking at food and beverages because both can, uh, can cause cross-contact cross issues. We're also looking at the utensils, the equipment and gloves. Just because you have a pair of gloves on, if you just handled some peanuts, then you still have those allergens on those gloves. We change the gloves, we wash our hands, we replace with fresh gloves. And so we're going to go into a little more detail about how do we wash our hands. Because hand washing is critical to everything that we do in our kitchen. Always make sure when we're trying to avoid cross-contact issues coming up, we're using assigned equipment. We're using specific equipment that we keep separate. Uh, make sure that you're um, using fryers, 
and the oil in the fryers um, separately. So if we've just cooked up some shrimp in that fryer, some popcorn shrimp in the fryer, we can no longer use that if someone is allergic to um, shellfish. So we would have to make sure that we would use a different uh, container to be cooking up our oil to be able to deep fry anything for that person or use a separate deep fryer if you have different deep fryers. So lastly, I'd like to talk a little about food defense. So this is where we can come into certain dangerous situations because there may be some different issues out there that could cause uh, damage to our food to the extent where it could poison someone. So what kind of issues can we have? Well, it could be a purposeful contamination from someone actually coming in and trying to destroy your company and in the meantime, possibly damaging the food and causing cross-contamination issues. It could be a competitor. It could be a former staff member who wants to come in and cause damage. Or it could be a guest. It could be that they're trying to tamper with the food in some sort of way. And it can occur, it can occur anywhere in your establishment. You must make sure that you make it as hard as possible for people to be able to tamper with your food. When you see certain fast food restaurants, uh, they may have out, uh, out the back of their restaurant, they might have a large walk-in cooler where they keep all the frozen foods and things like that. They generally, um, if you have a look at them, they will have a lock on those and they are relocked every time they go in and out of those to make sure that no one can get into them. It's very important that we never let anyone just come in and cause damage to our operation. So that's why you should always be asking questions. If someone walks into your kitchen and you don't know who they are, it's perfectly acceptable to ask them, can I be of assistance? Uh, you want to make sure that you know everybody who could be anywhere near any food or beverage items in your establishment so that you take seriously the responsibility to keep your food safe. But we control access into our establishment. Uh, we're making sure that our uniforms have things like name tags on it. If it's necessary, we may have security badges to be able to get into our establishment. And any suspicious activity that might be going on, we're reporting that. So when we're looking at the law on how we protect our food in this country, so you may be surprised to learn that it's not the federal government that decides the laws for every state and exactly what happens in every state. However, they do play a key role in exactly how it all, how it all works. So the Food and Drug Administration, the FDA, you may have heard about them. So they write the FDA food code. Now the food code is not a law. Uh, it recommends regulations. It's based on science. So they have um, a huge amount of resources on the federal level where they can uh, scientifically discover exactly what goes on with foods and how long it takes for contamination to cause problems and um, what you can do to stop it or slow it down. So they have a lot of information at their fingertips um, and a lot of data at their fingertips that they can use to advise the states. And this is exactly what happens. That, uh, that code book, the FDA food code, is actually then handed down to each individual state. It's up to the state then to, e to either adopt things or to not adopt things. But I can tell you that in general, if the FDA says that this is a safe environment to do a certain, you know, to have a certain um, working relationship with food, then generally the states adopt those items. However, so the state or the local authority de uh, department, health departments actually enforce the laws that the states create. So sometimes you can have a situation um, where a state has a certain law on things and then a local health authority may even have more enforcement on, the, on top of there as well. But it's your local health department that will actually be the people who will come in to do the inspection on your kitchen and on your establishment to make sure that you're doing everything you need to be doing. So those inspections are a formal review or an examination of your operation, um, and they're making sure that your operation is following food safety protocols from start to finish, from when that food comes in the back door, and making sure it's from reputable suppliers, all the way through 
to when your guests are enjoying those food items. All, in, all operations that serve the public must be inspected, um, and if they fail, then it's possible that some of them can be temporarily closed down, especially if it puts guests at imminent risk. And the fact is, is if a restaurant is closed down by the food department, by, by the health department, the chances are they will probably go out of business uh, because the trust is definitely damaged significantly when a restaurant has gone that badly wrong that uh, the health department is choosing to close them, even if it's temporarily. So what do successful managers do in this industry? So they understand the requirements. And so that's why you guys are going to be studying later on. Uh, you'll be studying the Serve Safe Manager and Food Handlers um, exams. And that's because we want you to understand and know all of these rules and all of these purposes of the rules and why it is that we use them to keep our food safe. So uh, a successful manager will create, po uh, create policies on exactly what it is that we do to avoid those problems that can come up. And they also conduct self-inspections uh, self as well. This is really important because a health inspector may come uh, into your establishment and in take a look at you once every about six months or so. But for us, it's more important that we're doing this on a day-by-day, hour-by-hour, minute-by-minute basis. If we look around and we see that incorrect methods are being used, then we need to be self-reporting and saying, hey, we need to change this. And that's where you're going to come in to help various different uh, places that you may work in uh, as you go through your career. You're always ensuring that the operation is being uh, safe and is prepared for everything that it needs to do. So we covered a lot of things today all about food safety and we're just getting started. So there's a lot of things to study when it comes to food safety um, from the, the entire establishment, from the front of the house to the back of the house, um, and even looking at the foods that we're bringing into our house as well. So we need to make sure that we understand all of these things, but this gives you a good idea to get started with. Uh, we're going to be doing a safety test in our, uh, in our kitchen before everyone can go into our kitchen, and that's so that we make sure that everyone is up to speed on everything that we should do. So please do ask me questions. If there's anything that doesn't make sense, if there's anything you're unsure about, please do, please do talk to me about it. And we're going to make sure that you fully understand everything so you feel confident. Because if there's one thing you should feel confident about in the kitchen, and, and that is, is that there's always safety in mind with the food, with yourself, with the customers that you're taking care of. I hope everyone has a wonderful day. Cheers.